Watts. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we spend much of today's show with the legendary filmmaker Stanley Nelson, one of the leading documentary documentarians of our time, as we turn to his latest documentary, Attica, with Tracy Curry, which tells the story of the deadliest prison uprising in U.S. history in 1971, when prisoners at the Attica Correctional Facility in upstate New York rebelled on September 9, 1971, overpowering guards taking over much of the prison to protest conditions before they were brutally suppressed. Stanley Nelson's extraordinary new film is nominated for an Academy Award um, for Best Documentary Feature. This is his first nomination in his more than three-decade-long career, making more than 30 films. He is a three-time Primetime Emmy winner, two for his work on Freedom Riders, which was added to the National Film Registry in the Library of Congress in 2020. This is the trailer for Attica. Attica was f fear. It was 70 percent black and brown. Prisoners, all white guards. What could go wrong? Grab the guards, grab the keys. All hell broke loose. Tell me this, are these primarily blacks? Guys were complaining about the basic things like toothpaste. A roll of toilet paper would last you a month. The inmates were considered like animals. They beat you up in your cell and then they take you to segregation and sometimes you don't come back. Have the inmates made any demands? There are all kinds of demands for change in the whole world. This had to be mediated, otherwise it was going to end in disaster. They wanted to use those weapons. Put your hands in the air and you will not be harmed. You will not be harmed. You will not be harmed. But that was good. They want to kill us. We are men. He was waking up America. Somebody had to take a stand. That's the trailer for Attica, the new documentary on Showtime that's actually streaming for free on YouTube until the end of Black History Month, co-directed by the legendary filmmaker Stanley Nelson, nominated for his first Academy Award. We're going to play some clips. But, uh, Stanley, let's start with why you made this film about the deadliest prison uprising in this country. They started September 9th. 1971, and Governor Nelson Rockefeller uh, called out the state troopers who opened fire on September 13th. I, I felt that that the uh, the story of Attica had never really been told. You know, I I was around uh, when it when Attica happened in 71, but I I never knew you know why the prisoners rebelled. I never knew why Rockefeller and and law enforcement went in. Uh, Attica uh, and just slaughtered uh, the inmates and, and the guards. So I, I thought that there was so much of, of the story that I didn't know, and, and I thought I, I thought and I think that that this is a really one of the really important American events that, that happened over the last fifty years. I want to go to the next clip, and that's if you could set it up the first night, Stanley. The first night of the uprising. Yeah, the, the, when the prisoners took over, one of the things that that is <clears throat> important that we understand about Attica is that uh, they held forty uh, guards and and civilian workers hostage, so law enforcement couldn't come in. And and this clip is is about the first night where they're actually out in the yard, you know, uh, at night for the first time, and there's. Uh, really, as one prisoner says, exuberation. And, and there's really a sense uh, that they're doing something that will change the prison system forever, and also a sense of freedom from not being locked up at night, many for the first time in a long time. Let's go to that clip. The guy next to me was named Raymond White. He was walking around, look up in the air, and it's dark, and it's, yo, Raymond White, yo, Ray. You all right? He said, man, I ain't been out after dog in 22 years. And we was talking, singing songs. It was, it was a festive night. I loved it. I loved it, man. I was out in, in, in the nighttime looking at the stars. 
I was drunk, I was happy, you know, I was, I liked it, you know. I was having a good time. And it was good, I, I felt free. I, I, you know, I mean, prison was there, but, you know, I felt free. I didn't have to hear the doors lock, locking. And if, and if it was a good feeling at that, that first night. When it got dark, uh, and everybody was talking about finding somewhere to sleep, but, you know, don't sleep alone and, you know, that type of thing. There's a lot of uh, psychopaths and sociopaths in those facilities. So, you know, you have to protect yourself from, from your peers, even. Well, I knew this was going to last forever. I knew there would, it would be a, an end to this. But just because we was incarcerated, it didn't mean that we were less than human. Somebody had to take a stand. A clip from the Oscar-nominated film Attica. So that's the first night. If you could talk about the conditions, and let's be clear, that was September 9th, 1971. It was basically two weeks after George Jackson was killed by prison guards at San Quentin. Um, and talk about the significance, his inspiration for these prisoners, and then what they were protesting, Stanley. I think one of the things uh, that, that was important is that, you know, this was 71. And, and so there's protests going on all, all over the country. You know, the Black Panthers, uh, the Young Lords, uh, uh, the prisoners are reading Malcolm X, and, and George Jackson is a real hero um, to, to the prisoners in Attica for his writings. Um, and when George Jackson was killed, um, the prisoners just felt um, that, uh, you know, it was the last straw, and they go on a hunger strike. And, and what they do is, you know, they refuse to eat, and, and it's not only the black prisoners, but it's it's the uh, white prisoners and and the Puerto Rican prisoners, and and that was really different because one of the things that the prison system did was separate uh, the prisoners by race and kind of pitted one race against the other. And so the death of George Jackson um, uh, was really an inciting incident in, in the takeover of Attica. I want to go back to Attica, in which the prisoners describe their reasons for taking um, guards as hostages, why Muslim prisoners were trusted to protect those hostages. When we got to DR with the hostages, we hollered, we got hostages. And you had about a thousand men shouting at us. You know, we need hostages to keep the police from coming and vamping on us. You gotta have hostages. That's the only, that's your only leverage. As long as they had the hostages, they didn't have guns and they didn't have this and they didn't have that, uh, but they had hostages and they're your people and you're responsible for your people. You're responsible to protect your people and do your job. Sit down, negotiate with us. Getting into the area where the 21 hostages are being held, they're in that main group. We can't distinguish the them because the prisoners have taken their clothing away and put prison clothes on. They were blindfolded in a circle in the middle of the yard. They also had guards, inmate guards, that were around them protecting them. And we seen them as captives. We seen them as people who were in our, our, under um, our supervision. So we couldn't do harm to them. Our understanding of Islam was that you don't harm a captive. Therefore, it was decided to allow the Muslim brothers to look out for them. A clip from the Oscar-nominated documentary Attica. Stanley Nelson, take it from there in these days. Uh, the um, 
prisoners taking hostages, their demands to be treated as human beings, their call for that observers' committee. Um, everyone uh, from uh, William Kunstler to David Rothenberg uh, to uh, Clarence Jones, uh, the publisher of the Amsterdam News, talk about that scene and how they understood they needed protection. We're just about to talk about what Governor Nelson Rockefeller did. And one of the things that the prisoners realized right away was that it, because they had hostages, they had a certain amount of control. So one of the things that they, they did was invited an observer committee. Um, which included some of the people that, that, that you named, because they thought that, that those people would be sympathetic and honest in, in, in the negotiations with the prisoners um, for, the, for their demands. Another really important thing for, for the whole incident, and for us as filmmakers, were that the prisoners invited the media in, because they felt that the media uh, would, would, would film this whole thing and would be and that would give them a certain amount of protection and so that the media would film the treatment of the hostages and know that the hostages uh, people outside would know that the hostages were, were treated fairly um, and so it, it for, for us as filmmakers there's just incredible incredible footage um, of, of the whole uprising because the media was invited in and and kind of given in, in many ways, you know, a free reign to, to film uh, the whole incident that went on for five days. I want to go to this final clip we've got of your film, Attica, prisoners describing the living arrangements they established during the uprising. You took a stick and you put a sheet over it and pulled it back, and that was your sleeping quarters. By the time guys started, uh, having to go to the bathrooms, it was, none were working. The guys that had been to Vietnam and been in the army, they said, we gotta make a latrine. They knew what a latrine was. I didn't know what a latrine was. There was this brother, and I said, brother, he was white. His car, they call him Tiny. And he was like a nurse before the Attica Rebellion happened. They set up a medical section in the yard for anybody who had any problems to go, and Tiny would take care of him. And um, the medical attention in the yard was much better than the medical attention we've got throughout the years. Oh, man, we had a good time. We was making wine and cooking food outside. It was like a big picnic, like a shanty town. You know, like Deadwood when uh, when uh, when uh, Buffalo Bill was out. You ever you ever watch Gunsmoke? The Western. Well, you Matt, Matt Dillon was the sheriff marshal of Gunsmoke. He kept order. And D y'all, we didn't have a Matt Dillon. Every man was a law unto himself. You did whatever the hell you wanted to do. And that, there was no order. That's a clip from Attica. If you can then describe, Stanley Nelson, what happened next, as the prisoners uh, thought that they were negotiating, um, dealing with the hostages, um, dealing with the Observers Committee, what was Governor Nelson Rockefeller doing in his final act? Well, first, I think it's important to understand that that, that uh, the prisoners had 30 demands, and 28 of those demands, the uh, the head of prisons had already met. You know, um, you know, more toilet paper and more showers, small things like that. So, 28 of the 30 demands were, were met, uh, and and finally, Governor Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller. Uh, of New York was in charge of the prison system. But he, you know, the, nobody understood that he was on the phone with Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon was was encouraging him not to meet the, the, the final demands, not to go up to, to Attica, because the prisoners were asking for Rockefeller to just come up to the prison. And, and the observer committee was asking for Rockefeller, just come to the prison. You don't have to go inside. 
you know, just show some concern. And, and Rockefeller refuses to do that and instead um, gives an ultimatum and finally orders law enforcement, over 500 uh, state troopers and former guards and guards uh, into Attica uh, with guns and rifles. And talk about how many people died, how many of them hostages. What was understood then, what was learned later, uh, something that the prisoners continually repeated about who killed the hostages. Yeah, uh, 39 people died, um, eight or nine hostages uh, were killed, um, and immediately it comes out in, in the news and the national news and in, in all the reporting that the hostages had slipped. Uh, I mean, the, the inmates had slit the hostages' throats and killed the hostages. And that's what's reported on, on, on the national media. And, um, <clears throat> you know, after the first day, and in fact, you know, uh, Richard Nixon, President Richard Nixon calls Rockefeller to congratulate him on, on the retaking of the prison. As we talk about institutional racism, um, I wanted to go to a broader question about what's happening today in the United States with African Americans and the police. You have a film coming up about this, but there are currently two federal hate crimes trials going on in St. Paul, Minnesota. There's the federal civil rights trial of the three former police officers involved in George Floyd's murder. In Georgia, jurors at the hate crimes trial um, of Ahmaud Arbery's murderers were shown graphic images of Arbery's autopsy. One one juror has asked the judge if there's money for counseling available after hearing the racist language used by the murderers and viewing these images of the damage to Arbery's bodies caused by the two close-range blasts from Travis McMichael's 12-gauge shotgun. Then you've got Texas, a grand jury indicting 19 Austin police officers on charges of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon for their roles in violently suppressing Black Lives Matter protests in 2020. News of the indictments came just hours after Austin Austin approved $10 million settlement with two protesters injured by police. And then you've got this video, um, the New Jersey NAACP calling on the Bridgewater Police Department to remove the officers, film breaking up a fight by violently arresting a black teen while allowing an older white teen to remain free. The video is just horrifying, as the white teen is put on a couch and the uh, Police officers put a knee on the back of the 14-year-old black boy, and then they handcuff him. Stanley Nelson, you're one of the leading uh, documentarians of the uh, black American experience. Um, can you talk about your response to all of this coming together now, not that it hasn't come together every day in U.S. history? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that 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 one of the things that has happened is, is that because, you know, everybody's walking around with a phone, you know, that has a camera, we're, we're seeing the, these things, you know, videotaped and, and pictures of these things. And so that uh, we can't de deny it anymore or, or the general public can't deny it. The police can't deny it in the same way. Um, but we're, we're just starting a film on the history of, of African-Americans and, 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 and the police. And I think the one thing we have to understand is these things are not just happening for the first time. These things are being filmed for the first time, from the time of, of, of the police um, evolving from slave catchers. There's been a, this this, this uh, very negative relationship between African Americans and 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 the police. Um, the the difference is, you know, now we're seeing it, and we're seeing it in a way that that can be played back, and so that we we're starting to understand it in a different way, and hopefully we're starting to to understand. Uh, the police in a different way. I think that that in, in some ways, you know, it, it's it's uh, reflected on on Attica, the film that that we did on Attica, because people are receiving in it in, in a different way. Because people are, I think, hopefully, a lot of people are less prone to just believe whatever law enforcement says. I wanted to end with a clip of your upcoming film on Frederick Douglass. He celebrated February 14th as his birthday, though the exact date of his birth has not been recorded. I wanted to go to a clip. In the summer of 1841, a grand anti-slavery convention was held in Nantucket. I was induced to express the feelings inspired by the occasion. 
and the fresh recollection of the scenes through which I had passed as a slave. The abolitionists that were there knew that they had this fugitive slave in the audience, and they asked Frederick, will you tell the audience what it was like to be enslaved? What shall I say of this experience? I have seen the cruelty and brutality of slavery, and I had been subjected to the depths of slave life. I was a graduate from this peculiar institution with my diploma written on my back. More Americans heard Douglas speak than any other American in the 19th century with the possible exception of Mark Twain. And it was significant that a former slave was famous. Frederick Douglass understood the power of his literature as a tactic of liberation. A man born enslaved who rose to become a man of growth, of self-mastery. Frederick Douglass has a very clear idea of what becoming means. He is becoming an orator, he's becoming a world leader, he's becoming a statesman. And for him, becoming is an ever unfolding process that he sees as self-creation. The teaser for the forthcoming documentary, Becoming Frederick Douglass, courtesy of Maryland Public Television, that's coming out in the fall, as well as a documentary on Harriet Tubman. Stanley Nelson, we have just 30 seconds. Your career has spanned more than 30 years, more than 30 amazing documentaries. How does it feel to be nominated for your first Oscar? It feels great. You know, I mean, it feels great. I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that, that that's so wonderful about it is that more people will, will see uh, Attica, you know, and, and for some some people, um, the fact that we're nominated, you know, is validation and, and a reason to see, see Attica, um, and, and that's what we want.